I'm hoping the next two days is going to be just as brilliant as the last two that we've had. Um, certainly these are exciting times for this area. Um, my name is Stephen Holgate. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm not an active practitioner in this field, but um, I have had an interest in it uh, through my own clinics that I used to run in Southampton where allergy was the focus and I used to get ME patients coming through uh, referred because of allergic problems and that's how I really got interested in it. So this is our third uh, conference uh, at a time of terrific excitement in the field and um, I'm so thrilled now that we're actually getting some real uh, exciting new and novel data that's beginning to emerge out of the uh, way that this complex group of conditions is now being in interrogated. <coughs> I'm going to try and work this uh, uh, thing. I think I can get it to go. I've got, I've got the light, but I don't think it's reaching the machine. It's, um, Sonia, not this other one. Yeah, I don't think. Well, it's one. Yeah, oh, oh, it's the that? bottom one. There we go. Thank you. So I just want to just, uh, you've got your program in front of you. I just want to, first of all, offer my very sincere thanks to those people who have traveled an awful long way to be here, from Australia and North America, Canada. Uh, it really is absolutely superb that you take the trouble to come and join us uh, for the next two days. And I hope you find this stimulating, as I'm sure we will when we hear what you have to say. And I've listed... Uh, our friends' names up there. Just to run through the two days, um, we've got a packed program, thanks to Sonia and uh, and the team, and Esther Crawley in particular, who's helped put all of this together. And uh, I, I won't have a chance to say thank you tomorrow, Sonia, particularly to you, and to Esther, I think, sitting at the back somewhere. But just to say thank you very much for your help. And Hugh Perry, who's very kindly uh, helped with the abstracts and organized the abstract session. So Hugh, thanks very much indeed. So today's session, we're going to cover some really exciting ground. And you can see in your program what we've got. And one of the nice things about this meeting is that we do have the patient sessions as well. And I think this time, we've probably got more emphasis on that than we've had previously, which is going to be very important for reasons that we will learn as we go through the meeting. Uh, and I've just listed some of the highlights uh, on this slide. So it is exciting because I think the world is beginning to wake up now to uh, new ways of approaching this complex group of conditions. So many of you in the room will be aware of this charity uh, called the Open Medicine Foundation, which is in the United States, which has raised money to try and set up a multi-omics type uh, analysis of severe chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, using this whole big data approach, and we'll be coming, talking a lot about that during the meeting. Uh, and this is the collection of samples and analyzing samples for complex interactions of particular molecules. And they're collecting in this particular study, uh, blood, saliva, sweat, urine, and feces. So they're really going for the big time. Uh, we shall certainly keep them out of mischief for a year or two, I'm sure, analyzing that lot. But I mean, it really is a very comprehensive. Um, and of course, what they want to try and do with all of this is to unpick the, the causative pathways of the disease and come up with new ways of diagnosing and hopefully identifying new ways of treatment. So I think that's really very exciting and very important. So at the same time, and one of the people on uh, the foundation is Robert Navio, who published this a couple of weeks ago um, in the Brazilian uh, National Academy of Sciences, which is really a very exciting first look at how omics might really start beginning to deliver some new biology. And what this report is all about, published, as I say, on September the 13th, is a metabolomics study where they took plasma and analyzed over 600 different chemical entities in the plasma in patients compared to controls. Uh, and obviously are trying to, again, find proteins uh, and other uh, metabolites that have, uh, and other molecules that have changed in relation to the disease. And what was quite remarkable, really, when they did their analysis is that they got a very distinct pattern that was emerging in these relatively severe uh, ME patients. And you'll see comparing 
the normals and controls. Here are the controls, here are the normals, here are the males, here are the females. There were differences in the metabolite between male and female, which is quite nice to know in, uh, in many ways, that they have some different proteins. And, but also the, a, a lot of shared pathways as well. And the important thing here to note is that there is a very distinct um, collection of proteins and metabolites that have changed, sorry, uh, metabolites that have changed in relation to this disease. And that's really important because if there is, as you can see here, relatively little overlap between the two groups, it really gives great promise for the opportunity of finding more of these very uh, novel uh, uh, pathways that may be involved in the condition. And this just compares what the fingerprint or handprint, as they sometimes refer to this uh, as, compares it to, to uh, when the body is stressed, uh, expressing cell danger, or as looking at the proteins, uh, looking at the metabolites in relation to uh, the metabolic syndrome. You'll see that in chronic fatigue syndrome, that there is this reduced state of many of the metabolites that they call a dour state. And this is an interesting um, metabolic signature, this so-called dour state, because it's a signature that uh, is found uh, in uh, C. elegans, which is a nematode worm, which is used a lot for molecular and genetic studies in biology. Uh, and its complete gene sequence is fully understood, and that's why it's used so frequently. And this dour state, which is uh, quite uh, amazing, uh, is a state that this, this worm goes into here, which is really uh, in response to adverse environmental stimuli. It goes into this hibernation state almost, uh, where the metabol metabolism slows down. And this signature, which is the, a very similar one to that found in, uh, in chronic fatigue syndrome in this metabolic study, suggests that uh, patients are entering into this state in response to massive environmental stress, which is of course what we probably think about in relation to how the disease begins in the first place. And so what's exciting really is that one can take biology, in this case in a worm, and look at the biology uh, um, using this non-hypothesis driven approach, using in this case metabolomics, and come up with these amazing uh, um, signatures which obviously are highly relevant if we want to come out with uh, particular pathways. And here we can see that this particular state is used a lot by biologists when they want to study stress uh, it, against the environment. Um, so I think this is a real breakthrough. Uh, obviously like all these things it has to be repeated. This was only on 44 individuals so we're not talking about a massive number of subjects here. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a very promising start indeed. An attempt has been made, uh, or is being made to repeat this. There's another study that will be published soon, uh, which has come out of a, a, another laboratory in the US, looking here, but this time uh, rather fewer subjects, but they've also found uh, a decrease in the metabolites. And what's interesting about these two studies, as you'll see with this little descriptor here, is that they were all using different methods. And despite the fact they were using different methods and different analytical procedures, came up with a very similar answer, which I think is, to some extent is encouraging. But all, what we want to do, of course, is not use lots of different methods uh, from different laboratories. We want to try and make standard operating procedures uh, uh, imposed on this population so that we get a much larger number of patients studied by the same methods. And so this is this incredibly exciting project that we first introduced to you, I think, last year. We called it the Grand Challenge then. I think that was the name we gave it. It's got renamed. We had a competition for the name. Esther uh, uh, um, launched a competition. We all put suggestions in. And Chris Ponting, I think, came up with this one, which is Mega, which sounds quite a good name, really. Uh, so it's the ME uh, CFS Epidemiology and Genomics and then the group doing it is the Alliance. And we had a workshop in Bristol uh, earlier in the year, and we got together the most amazing people here from all across the United Kingdom, scientists of the highest quality in all that different domains, uh, led uh, in a way by George David Smith, and that's why we're meeting in Bristol, uh, who we'll be hearing about in a few minutes, 
um, but also this uh, amazing team of clinical researchers here who understand about the clinical phenotype. And the idea of this study, just to give you a little bit of lead into the next talk, um, is to collect these patients. And we're aiming between 12 and 16,000 patients, not 40 patients, 1,000 patients with a broad definition of chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. Uh, already it's getting a lot of traction and enthusiasm, and I'll put this slide, which has got a nice picture of Sonia on it. Uh, this was the launch of the MRC Phenome Centre in Birmingham, and one of our collaborators in this uh, team is Warwick Darlan. You'll see what he said about this particular. He actually is launching his centre using our uh, plan program uh, as an exemplar, which is really nice, and uh, I'm grateful to him. Uh, he's at the moment in Washington, um, at a meeting uh, on metabenomics, and Francis Collins, who leads the National Institute of Health, uh, said this yesterday at the meeting. Um, and Rick very kindly sent us that little message, which basically says it all, I think. If somebody like Collins, is, uh, you know, who runs the National Institute of Health, is saying that here's a great example of metabolomics illustrating metabolic pathways, and that will obviously uh, go a long way to help us, I think, get the confidence we need to move this field forward. Okay, so this is it. 10,000 uh, 10, adults, 2,000 children. I'll go through it quite quickly because you'll hear more about it during the meeting. And we're going to do a big data study. I mean, similar to what you saw with multiple omics, starting with genomics, starting with the, with the DNA sequencing, but also then spreading all the way through the cellular processes through transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and even microbiomics uh, and seromics. So we'll be uh, seromics. So we'll be looking at trying to uh, put all this together and come up with uh, some pathways. And of course, one of the key things about this is the huge effort that's going to go into getting patient involvement here. This is crucial to a successful program. You can have all the omics in the world, but unless you get the patients and the phenotyping right, then it's all a waste of time. And Sonia and, and uh, the other charities are doing a fantastic job in getting support for all of this through the patients and the public, uh, which we, we hope uh, will be launched during this meeting, uh, which will be great too. Uh, and I'll end up with just this, because Sonia asked me to put it up, to try and get greater public attention into this area, because it is a grossly under-managed and under-researched field, as we all know. Uh, and I think, Sonia, you've got another one of these uh, Missing Millions uh, um, uh, events coming up, which will be a virtual one on September the 27th. Um, which is uh, now, yesterday, is it? When is it? Yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Now, tomorrow, yesterday. No, anyway, it's just <laughs> happened. It's just happened. Anyway, you had one in May. There's another one this month, and, and there we are. Just to say that we're obviously, the date of this meeting is very timely. So, I just want to say thank you very much indeed again for coming. Uh, we are on the threshold of an extraordinary journey, and I just hope the enthusiasm and commitment of people sitting in this room and beyond are going to enable us to, to keep the energy up as we go forward uh, and try and get this thing properly supported and funded, which is what we're all going to try and do. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to hand over now to my good friend and colleague from Southampton, Hugh Perry, uh, who has um, a very great interest in this area as well, and he's going to run the morning session. Thank you, Hugh, very much. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks, Stephen, and, and thank you for uh, kicking the meeting off. I think it's pretty clear uh, we are uh, moving forward at a pace, and I hope that uh, we will continue to, to gather the same sort of momentum as we've gathered from the last few meetings, and um, this will uh, make a difference, which is what we're setting out to do. So the session this morning is about big data, biomarkers, and uh, stratification. Uh, it's pretty obvious from what um, Stephen said, big data is important, biomarkers are important for diagnosis, monitoring disease, and so forth, and stratification is pretty important in almost any complex disease. Uh, it's very unlikely that everybody from one end of the spectrum to the other has uh, precisely the same disease, so we need to know what the subsets are. And we have some great speakers lined up, 
uh, to uh, tell us about this today. And our, our first speaker is David Patrick. He's come all the way from uh, British Columbia, and he's going to tell us about researching a syndrome, findings from the UBC uh, Complex Chronic Disease Study Group. Uh, Patrick, David, go on. Yeah, Sonia's kind of yeah, sprints cheaper. It's better than I can. Yeah. Okay. And the slide advance is bottom. It's the bottom button. Yeah. Bottom button. Right. Yeah. The bottom. Well, it's an honor to be here um, to talk about our study, uh, but also to be among um, uh, people who we've read about and uh, a chance to network. It's also nice to be back in the country of my birth. Um, in part because I may sound foreign to you to a certain extent, but you all sound like my extended family, so I feel very much <laughs> um, as a result. So um, I'm re here representing a group from the University of British Columbia uh, in Vancouver, but also uh, other collaborators around North America. Um, we have a large study team. I wouldn't be able to do this kind of work as an infectious disease epidemiologist without genomic people like Pat Tang and Jen Gardy, who are uh, my colleagues. Ruth Miller down there in the artful thing is an Oxford grad postdoc who's just finished with us who did a lot of this work. And lots and lots of clinicians and scientists. But we've also been able to collaborate with uh, some groups in North America that you should know about. At UCSF we have Charles Chu and Jerome Bouquet. They've been able to help us out with transcriptomic work uh, recently. The Workwell group, you may know their work in terms of cardiopulmonary exercise testing in MECFS. We recently forged a collaboration with Arizona State University um, to look at uh, immunosignatures, and I'll be talking about those with the peptide arrays that help you interrogate the antibody response very broadly. And uh, we've recently also hooked up with the University of Bergen group um, in, in order to see some, see some um, synergy between our work. So I like to mention disclosures. I don't have commercial conflicts of interest. Our um, studies are basically MRC-like uh, organizations funding us. And of course, ME Research UK is helping um, extend some funding on an NIH-funded project that we're underway with right now. <laughs> So how I get into this is I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. We've messed, messed with HIV and SARS and pandemic flu and things. And when, uh, when the XMRV debacle came along, we thought there must be ways to do it better. And of course, there have been lots of successes in this. You know, here's Barry Marshall. He's the guy who showed us that Helicobacter is partly responsible for our, our ulcers and things like that. And of course, as, as an Australian scientist, he did it by swallowing the Helicobacter and proving it on himself. We don't recommend that for the most part. But of course, we've had lots of stories like that. Uh, tuberculosis was solved in the late 19th century along with 20 other infectious diseases. Um, we've learned that cancer of the cervix is, of course, driven by an infectious disease. And last night, we were having a bit of a discussion about how uh, it appears that some people with childhood asthma may be disadvantaged if they're not exposed to the right microbes early in life and, and, and if it doesn't make up the right part of their microbiome. So speaking to this metabolomics side of things, a lot of what's driving metabolism in us is our gut microbiome and these things are all connected. So why not MECFS? This is why we got involved. Now, in the Canadian context, Margaret Parler, who's par part of our national action group, or the advocacy group, is a statistician, and she, got, she, she helped go through the Canadian Community Health Survey. And we find that over 1% of Canadians have been told at one point in their life that they've got chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, not that many people would hit a research case, case definition or anything, but highly prevalent condition. Moreover, the level of disability is just as high or higher than established chronic diseases like uh, diabetes, rheumatological disease, and that kind of thing. Now, we were interested in you know, the history of putative etiologies. You've all followed the stories about viruses. Could it be Epstein-Barr? Could it be uh, bacteria? And many studies taking a look at these one at a time or two at a time. So one of the reasons to get into metagenomics is that instead of playing 20 questions and getting to the end of your 20 questions and not having guessed right, you get to look at the universe of what might possibly be going on. Environmental triggers are important, and that's why the metabolomic mm -hmm. things are interesting. Mitochondrial dysfunction has been mentioned as a possibility. And then this hit and run hypothesis, the idea that some stress, whether it's an infection or a life stress, sets us into dis disequilibrium uh, in an ongoing way. How can we explore that immunologically? And that's why I want to explain our interest in these immunosignatures that um, Arizona State University is working with. 
So we have problems, though, in researching a syndrome, and it's probably important to be very honest about them up front. Um, the, come on. The, the pathophysiology is still largely unknown. We have no reliable biomarkers, and that leads to imperfect case definitions. That means we have misclassification. As an epidemiologist, it's very important because we're probably lumping people with several different physiologies into the same definition at the moment. That makes it much harder to find differences, so I salute the efforts to get much larger sample sizes um, going. We may be looking at many disorders that are currently under the same umbrella. So we talked about intriguing directions from, from Stephen. I thought also the, the Hornig and Lipkin work on cytokine networks was interesting, uh, Navio interesting, and the B cell depletion trials going on across the North Sea are quite interesting. But I also wanted to sort of uh, put an element of caution, particularly with the, sort of the first two sets of observation. We've had false hope before. We had it with XMRV. Uh, but it's also important to point out that both Navio's study and the others are cross-sectional in nature. So, that, so, so we're not able to infer cause and effect yet. Uh, but there are study designs that we can work towards which allow us to do a better job of causal inference. The clinical trials are part of it. But taking a look at this in terms of long-term population-based cohorts in which people enter healthy and later have developed uh, ME, um, that these, are, these are ways in which we can infer, ca infer causality because we can follow temporal logic along the way. So more trials and more prospective cohort studies are needed. <coughs> Now, um, the purpose of the UBC complex chronic disease study is really to form hypotheses. So uh, we know we, we have a small study, and we're guilty of being a small study. But we wanted to, just like uh, turning the telescope to the skies for the first time, to take a look at uh, th this disorder in new ways for the first time, make some observations that then allow us to create hypotheses for these other study designs. That's the purpose. And this is a picture of uh, Andreas Solarius, hypothesis about elliptical orbits, uh, again, based on the observation that, uh, that, that uh, what you actually saw didn't fit with the current theory. And that's the whole idea. And the platforms we've been employing are metagenomics, so this is high throughput sequencing for viral and bacterial discovery. Uh, transcriptomics, which is the same sequencing technology, just looking at messenger RNA as a, as a way of telling us which of our genes are switched on or switched off. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this immunosignature uh, uh, technology, but the idea is, you, is to interrogate the antibody repertoire so that you can look at both infection history but also at autoimmunity. Uh, the study design is simple, cross-sectional um, case control. And we've enrolled people using the, the Canadian 2003 case definition. If we want to talk about case definitions, we'll go to the pub after and talk about uh, you know, which ones need to be sorted. Age and gender matched healthy controls. We also uh, wanted a disease control with a more defined illness. So we, we, we got together with the rheumatologists and entered some people with systemic lupus, uh, another condition where fatigue can be a, a pretty prominent component. And then this other group um, it, it was, uh, was necessary for a number of reasons. It's ultimately defined chronic Lyme, um, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. But it also had to do with the funding. So we did the usual clinical assessments, reviews for case definitions, and studies for um, uh, uh, of, of etiology. Why did we include this sort of chronic Lyme group? Well, I know this has been the, the issue on this side of the pond as well, but we've got an, another people who, group of people who has sometimes a similar phenotype but a fixed belief about a particular, uh, a particular uh, set of causes. And we were also working with this group at UCSF who's already been working on Lyme disease from the transcriptomic point of view. This is proven Lyme disease, so we thought it would be interesting to compare and contrast. And it was uh, also a, a big driver of the funding, quite frankly. So the study outputs, um, we've published a couple of methods papers and some minor reports on uh, exercise testing and functional scales. The major paper describing the, uh, the group is, was in clinical infectious diseases uh, last year. And what I'll uh, drop some hints about today are, we've got a, the metagenomics paper in review at a journal um, at the moment, um, the gene expression paper, uh, similar sort of thing, uh, in review at a journal, and the immunosignature work uh, will be presented in full at the IACFSME in Fort Lauderdale. So I'm not allowed to give you exactly the details, but I will tell you the directions we're going uh, because it, I think we should be able to talk about that. So the groups we're looking at 
Only 25 uh, yeah. chronic fatigue and 25 healthy. Um, we had smaller numbers in the in the Lyme and lupus uh, group. The uh, the matching worked pretty well, except for the Lyme group, because it's hard to match four different groups in terms of age and gender. And the only big difference on this thing overall is that is the BMI, the weight of the average ME patient was uh, was higher than the other groups. Now I'm not going to give you the whole details from the paper, but uh, there's a pointer here, isn't there? Yes, there we are. Uh, but the, the point here is here's chronic fatigue and here's the alternately defined Lyme. And all these things here are really the parts of the definition of ME, apart from the things that exclude. And of course, 100% here. But very high for this alternately diagnosed uh, Lyme group as well. In fact, most of them actually met the US Facuda case definition um, down here. And very few of them, surprisingly, actually had the sort of the tick exposure that you might like. So many of them we consider to be people who may well have ME, but who've been misled by a, a bad lab in the US. Um, so uh, we, we had a number, we took a look at a number of scales, and I'm not going to show you uh, these small diagrams too much, but the most important things to look at are the SF36 and the Karnofsky here showing uh, similar levels of disability between chronic fatigue and alternately defined chronic Lyme. And if you're just above 60 on the Karnofsky, it's a level of disability that precludes work uh, for most people. And this was the walking well who came into our clinics um, uh, for this, not the severely <coughs> people who we're going to hear about at the poster sessions. The other thing, if you take a look at all these scales, is that those scales that measured um, on the mental health scales were far less distinguishing between the groups. Um, we did so, a lot of background work with Lyme reference labs. Suffice it to say that the, none, nobody had, had actual Lyme disease, uh, including those with alternately defined uh, chronic Lyme. And I, so I won't go into that stuff in detail. And then, um, you know, Hornig and Lipkin had a very big uh, cytokine panel. We were only able to measure eight or ten. But just to make a long story short, uh, we ourselves did not find any significant difference in cytokine expression in, in, the, in the peripheral blood. Now, some of the important differences are that Hornig and Lipkin had a lot of people in the first three years of diagnosis, and that was the, that was the group in, in whom they, they, they said things were going on. But their most interesting findings, quite frankly, were messing around with Dan Peterson's CSF specimens. Uh, I mean, see, it's the, the cerebrospinal fluid um, specimens. And, I think that's interesting, but it's, it's a cross-sectional study that, again, needs to be validated um, in, in other places. So in summary, basically, um, the, the cl clinical description were that we, we, we found that this Lyme group was very similar to the, the ME, uh, and that's why we wanted to go on to take a look at these platforms. Uh, the, the group was, was clearly sick enough to want to understand their causes as well. So I was asked to talk a little bit about our various involvement with exercise testing, which is, is really sub-studies of, of, of the main study, but I wanted to honor that request. And the first thing we did, uh, along with the, uh, the Metabolic Diseases Unit, was a sub-study um, of submaximal exercise testing. Now, the reason we did this for the study was actually uh, as, a, as part of a screen for mitochondrial disorders, which was, was part of the study. We had biochemical screen, screening as well. And um, uh, we, we used the submaximal test because we were interested in seeing what was going on with, uh, with uh, tissue oxygenation mm -hmm. and offloading of oxygen at tissue level without necessarily inducing a symptom flare in, in everybody if possible. So this setup here has basically got somebody making repeated uh, fist, fist movements. If you're, you're deconditioned but you're connected to the world by the internet, the finger, the, the muscle that's probably in the, in the best shape is this one, because, and that's your flex, flexor digitorum. So we, we actually wanted to see a muscle that was in regular use in people with ME, whether there would be you know, any, any, any big, big change there. So you, you can do this repeated uh, wrist thing, and you've got this sensor that basically picks up the color of your blood. And the color of your blood is going to change with respect to whether it's regular hemoglobin with lots of oxygen on it or deoxyhemoglobin where you've offloaded. And the more deoxyhemoglobin that you've got uh, under measurement in exercise, the more oxygen is being offloaded into the tissue and being used by the mitochondria and everything else. So um, I, I won't. Uh, give, this was a, su a sub study. Uh, I won't. I think I've already sort of described that sort of stuff. But we measured exertion 
both in terms of the, the person's own perception on Borg's exertion scale, but also, it, also objectively um, using the machine. And um, well, I could talk about the statistics, but you know, standard statistics to compare things between groups. So the first thing I wanted to show you was, um, was, uh, was, was the, the, this set of curves, where the red represents people with ME. And this took us to the pub one night uh, when we began to take a look at this because we thought we'd found something um, interesting. Because you notice that all the, most of the lower curves are sort of in the, in the red down there, are near the bottom. That means that you're getting less deoxyhemoglobin, you're offloading less oxygen to the tissue during this sort of, uh, sort of standardized um, exercise along the way. And we thought, well, we might have something there, it'd be interesting, and we s spoke with the clinical biochemists and so forth. But we also, as we always do when we sit in the pub, is we say, well, what could be wrong with our work? Or, or what other explanations might, uh, might, uh, m might be important to take into account here? And um, we took a look at the measured exertion, and we said, oh, well, yeah, in terms of actual the physics of this, the, the, the measured in newton seconds, there was actually more exertion going on in the healthy controls than in the, uh, th those with ME. Now, that's a problem. Because, uh, because the use of oxygen is a stochastic thing. It's going to be in proportion to the amount of effort um, that's used. So we, we needed to be able to adjust for that. And in, in contrast, of course, the perceived exertion was the other way around, and as, as we might well understand. So when we actually went to the trouble of correcting for uh, the, the, the physical work done in Newton seconds, the, the thing disappeared altogether. And we, we threw into our multivariate models, you know, age, body mass index, hemoglobin, and so forth. And, uh, and basically, we, we were finding that, as we know, people with ME are less able to, 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 to generate work, but the, our oxygen findings didn't really point to anything else. So the conclusions there was we, we, we couldn't distinguish in an adjusted analysis between ME, CFS, and controls. It was a useful screening test because this actually took three people to the metabolic screening unit. None of them was subsequently found to have any objective mitochondrial disorder, but it was a useful screening test for, uh, for that purpose. Now I'm going to say a little bit about our uh, other platform work, and then I'll cycle back to talk about the maximal exercise testing that we're doing with the, the group from the Workwell um, uh, Foundation in California. So for those of you who haven't met metagenomics in detail, uh, the, the bottom line is you, you're, if you can start with blood or any other tissue um, you know, up here, and then what you've got to do is you've got to extract the nucleic acid from it, uh, make sure that you've got a, a high quality specimen, and then you put it through one of these machines. In most cases, it's one of these alumina machines, a HiSeq or a MySeq. We got a plane here because the Quebec government on the other side of the country was subsidizing genomic work for a while, so we got it done a lot cheaper in Montreal than we could do it in Vancouver. And then what comes off the sequencing is millions of these flat files of about 